Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. I'm Brian Warren. And I'm Lori Hartshorn. We are so thrilled that you've joined us today. You know, if you're honest with yourself, many of us battle with insecurity. Sometimes those who hide it best feel it most. False beliefs about ourselves cause insecurity, and mm -hmm. it can be debilitating. If you're struggling right now, we want you to know that there are prayer pe partners waiting by to pray with you. They are. And today's show will also bring hope. You'll see two people who found new identities in Christ and have put the insecurities and questions in their rear view mirror. Mm. Have you ever struggled with insecurity? Uh, uh, absolutely. I think any, I mean, we'd be a liar if we didn't say we had been, you know. And I, when I worked for John Maxwell, we used to teach leadership across the nation. And uh, I'll never forget the most, empow most impactful lesson was the number one way that leaders sabotage themselves, mm -hmm. insecurity. Mm. And insecurity often raises its ugly head where a high need for control, you know, got in, people got to know that you're the boss, all of those things, this is actually a sign of insecurity. Yeah. What about you, Brian? You so, know, uh, again, coming out of a different uh, arena altogether, um, you, I played with some of the most prolific athletes. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was with uh, the USFL and I played with Doug Williams. He was the first black quarterback to win the Super Bowl for the Redskins. Wow. And in that, in that locker room, it was the billionaire boys club because you had him, Rick Neuheisel, you had the Heisman Trophy winner and everything else. And you couldn't be insecure in that moment mm. because if you didn't, your dream was over like that. Right. So what I found in that place, sometimes they overcompensated. Yeah. Yeah. And so instead of being insecure, they were overconfident, yeah, right? Because yeah. you just had to have that swag. Yeah, that's one of the ways we hide it. If you need more encouragement today, psychologist Dr. Mary Lynn has some powerful advice on how you can change your thought life. But first, his identity was shaped by a traumatic childhood experience, and this is how God gave Larry a new life. You go to sleep crying yourself to sleep, literally cursing God, cussing God with the, the, the words you'd learned that day at school. Larry Blue was nine years old when his world came crashing down. His parents separated, and that same year, a relative began to physically and sexually abuse him. Larry blamed God. I was praying, obviously, and naturally for God to bring my dad back home and for the abuse to stop. And then when, you know, dad didn't come back home, got remarried, the abuse kept going. And so the anger kept building. I decided at a really early age, at nine, that God must not exist. In his teen years, Larry tried to numb his pain. I had started gambling, looking at pornography, um, drinking alcohol at 13 years old, and grew mushrooms and sold them at school, made my own acid or LSD, sold it at school. Just about anything I put my hands on was becoming an addiction. After high school, Larry served two years in the Army and stopped using drugs. But after he left the service, he became a roadie for a band and started working large concerts. Drugs and alcohol were readily available. My career fed my, my addiction and my lifestyle fed my addiction and they all just fed into each other. It was really hard to break out of that cycle um, doing that career. There was very little accountability. I didn't have to drive much when I was on the road working. So I just continued to use, drink. Um, the drug addiction just went spiraling out of control again. In his 30s, Larry stopped traveling and tried to settle down. He married and had a daughter, but his addictions were still in control. The thing I was looking for most was the next high. And it started as soon as I woke up in the morning. Larry was arrested for numerous DUIs and served short stints behind bars. After his third arrest, his wife left and his family completely cut ties. I didn't want treatment. I didn't want help. I didn't think there was anything wrong with me. I thought it was everybody else's problem and not mine. In September 2001, Larry was arrested for his seventh DUI and was handed a 14-year prison sentence. The judge right away started to tell me, you can forget about getting a bond, you can forget about getting bail, you're going to prison. Um, no one was taking any of my phone calls. I had burnt all the bridges, and I was finally left alone with the Lord. And that's exactly what had to happen. For the first time in years, Larry started to pray. He also started reading the Bible. You know, I knew nothing about God. I had been atheist all my life. When I started to read the Bible, I said to God, I will read every word of this. And I had read through the whole New Testament 
After reading about the life and teachings of Jesus, Larry wanted more. So he went to a prison church service where the pastor challenged the inmates to give their lives to God. And at the end of that sermon, even though I, I had just honed in on every word that preacher had said, I was still reluctant to go forward. And in that split second, I thought, I've been a military policeman, I've been a stagehand, camera operator, I've experienced all these other things, drug addiction, um, I've never tried this. Um, I was one of the last people to go forward to the altar call. He put one hand right in the center of my chest and one hand around me on my back, and he started to pray. It was like somebody had taken honey out of the microwave in a, you know, like a measuring cup and just poured it down the back of my neck. And I felt this warmth just coming all over my body. And then I thought, I don't care what this is, I just want more God, just pour it on me. That changed everything for me. Larry says that day he was immediately delivered from all of his addictions. He also gained the courage to forgive his childhood abuser. It took me several days of prayer um, and asking the Lord to help me to forgive her. I realized that I was never gonna grow. I was never gonna fully mature as a person until I found the strength somehow to forgive my abuser. Larry was in prison less than a year when the judge gave him a six-year home detention sentence. It was later reduced to only six months. That was definitely the favor of God. There's no way an attorney could have worked that out for me. No matter how much money I would have paid to go from a six-year sentence to a six-month sentence, that was definitely the favor of God. After his release, Larry earned a degree in theology and began leading a church prison ministry. Today, he's still free from his addictions and has restored his relationship with his daughter. He's also a licensed addiction counselor for the Salvation Army. I'm sure there's young people out there, like I was, I'm sure there is, that are thinking, oh no, not a guy, another guy talking about Jesus. What I would say to those people right now is, get a hold of the Lord now before more of your life is gone. God has done miraculous things in my life in such a short period of time. Don't wait, reach out for Him now. You know you're in trouble when? <laughs> you finish the sentence. You know, with Larry, um, when the judge said, you can forget about bail, you're going to jail. <laughs> and he said, I've been an atheist all my life, and he really had no, no reason for God, no need for God. He's like, how are you doing? Just fine. Where's God in your life? Same place he always been. I wonder if that's why you tuned in today. And you know what we do here. We tell people about the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. You know, when he was young, it started with uh, alcohol. And he said, my career fed my addiction. God doesn't want to be your addiction. Many times we trade our addiction for an attraction that becomes an addiction. We call that God. But today, this is what Larry says. And I think this is so powerful. He says, don't wait until you lose more of your life. Make the choice now. God can turn it around. And he was able to bring him out of prison as well. What's your prison? If you could say that one thing and put your finger on it, I want to pray with you, but I also want to get something into your hands, free indeed. Because John 8, 32 says, whom the Son makes free is free indeed. Most people have no need until they get where you are right now. But when you get there, now you're ready for a supernatural miracle. Why don't you pray this prayer with me? Jesus, I'm tired. I'm sick and tired. I confess my sin. I've messed up, Lord, once, twice. But now I'm coming to you. I open my heart. Come into my life. Make me the person you want me to be. In Jesus' name. Hey, that's straight talk. I want you to call the number on the screen now. If you're really serious, 1-855-759-0700. Prayer partners are standing by, and we're not going to embarrass you, but we're going to take you in that next step of your walk. I really believe this is a good day for you. Up next, a young girl grows searching for peace and finds a new identity. Mm -mm -mm.
everything that we did and everything that we believed built on that foundation of knowing who we are as Muslims in America. Giselle Katri grew up in a family who demanded strict adherence to the Quran and Islamic faith. For her, it was the only way to earn her parents' love. I believe that staying true to Islam was something that my parents and I uh, would bond over. If I did, as they requested for me to do, like going to the mosque with them and, and participating in Ramadan fasting, it would bring us closer. But none of those things brought Giselle's family closer together. In fact, her parents fought constantly. Sometimes I would wake up and I would have to leave the house with my mom in the middle of the night. I could go to bed thinking everything's fine and wake up the next morning and it was disaster. As for Giselle, her prayers to Allah offered little comfort. Allah seemed just really distant from me and didn't really feel as though I was being listened to. I felt more of like I was going through the motions, not really feeling anything in return from God, any love or support or hope. I wanted that peace that people keep talking about um, that Islam represents, and I didn't ever feel that. When Giselle was a senior in high school, her father ended the marriage, and her mother started a new family. After I went through all that with my family, I just kind of felt like I wasn't worthy of any affection or love, and so I looked for it for my parents and didn't get it, and um, it kind of was a reminder, hey, Giselle, you're not that you're not that great. If you were great, your family wouldn't have left you behind. The thought of the future, even the thought of tomorrow, the very next day, would just bring me into a panic because I just never knew what was going to happen. During college, she started working part-time at a private school. By then, Giselle's anxiety was triggering debilitating panic attacks. Imagine you see a car about to hit you that's not slowing down or trying to stop. It was just like that, but all the time. I thought I was gonna die. And my heart rate would just increase. Um, I would start sweating and just, I felt darkness, like a dark cloud over my head. During those times, it wasn't Allah that gave Giselle comfort. It was the school's administrator, Connie, who was a Christian. Whenever I would have panic attacks at work, she would pray with me. I would feel a lot of peace. And I never felt that way when I finished praying my Islamic prayers. I was like, what is Miss Connie doing? What does she have that I don't have? Whatever it is, I want it. Connie invited her to church, but what Giselle saw and heard there wasn't what she expected. During that service, I learned about atonement, how Jesus died for our sins. As a Muslim, I didn't really even understand why Jesus had died. It was just kind of like, hmm, maybe this is true. It was kind of like a something, it gave me something extra to think about. Parts of the Quran were already wrong about what Christians believed. Um, it wasn't representing Christianity in its truth. It just kind of made me question a lot, a lot more. Giselle wrestled with her doubts. A few days later, she had the worst panic attack she'd ever experienced. I was like, maybe I should try what Miss Connie did. Maybe I should try, try praying. So I started off, you know, praying like she did. I tried to model her prayer and say some of the words that I remembered her saying. When I did that, I remember seeing this huge flash of light in front of my face, and it was kind of like when you close your eyes and you look at the sun, that orangey glow, and feeling an overwhelming huge wave of just peace and love. And I fell immediately asleep, and sleep was the last thing on my mind. When she woke up the next morning, Giselle opened a Bible she had received as a gift and began reading it front to back. What I found in there was just so much peace. And Isaiah 49, it mentions how God is so loving that even if a mother forgets um, about their child or abandons their child, that God will never abandon you and that your name is written on his hand. And I very much identified with that. And knowing that God loved me and um, cared about me in that way, that was something unique to me that I had never even had any sort of inkling about. So. God really showed up when, um, when, he, when I needed him the most, so. Over the next few weeks, Giselle studied and compared sources until she was convinced that Jesus is the Son of God. I really came to the knowledge of, okay, Jesus claimed to be God, and if this is true, what are the implications of that? The resurrection isn't just mentioned in the Bible. The crucifixion isn't just mentioned in the Bible. 
There's historical accounts outside of the Bible that really resonated with me. And knowing that there is history behind it tells me that there's truth in that. And I just said, God, I accept that you are who you say you are. I accept that you're Jesus, and I accept that you are God. And I am sorry for the things that I've done that have hurt your heart. Um, I'm just so glad that you've brought me to the knowledge of who you are, and I accept you as my God. And that was the day that, you know, after that, never again panic in any sort of way, never again. Today, Giselle shares her new faith with confidence. I want everything that I do and I say to represent him. And that gives me such an amazing purpose in life because I'm God's representative here. I get to be his hands and feet and show other people what God's like. And just like Miss Connie showed me the love of Jesus through her actions and through her prayers with me, I can now do that for other people. Giselle also says knowing God cares for her has changed everything. Instead of me being fearful for tomorrow, I embrace it and I um, I'm running into it. I can no longer think that I'm worthless because if my name is written on God's hand, as Isaiah 49 mentions, then that means that He cares immensely about me and He's always thinking about me. So I need to always think about Him. <laughs> Giselle, growing up in a Muslim home, her view of God would be a God is to be feared. God is someone who will judge you. God is someone who you will never measure up to. But when she came into the true knowledge of who God is through our Lord Jesus Christ, I love what she said, how she understood that Jesus just being mentioned in the Bible that he resurrected and that he was crucified, that really wasn't enough for her. She needed to know that there were historical evidence behind the Bible, that as she sought out and studied it, history proves the Bible. And she came uh, really to a living, breathing truth that God is interested in all people. She was free, actually, set free from her panic attacks and her fear. You know, maybe that's you today and you need to find peace. You've been struggling with panic and fear. Your idea of God is a God only to be feared. Can I tell you that the Lord Jesus Christ said himself that I have come, I am the Prince of Peace. I have come to set you free. That is the God of the Bible, as we see through demonstrated in the love of our Lord Jesus. Do you need peace today? I believe that someone out there needs to call this number, 1-855-759-0700. You need to do some business with God. Maybe you have more questions about who is this God? There are warm and loving people on the other end of that phone that want to answer your question and lead you to the Prince of Peace. But it starts with a simple prayer like this. Will you pray this with me? Father, I didn't know that you were loving, but I, I hear today that you're a God of peace and I want peace in my life. Would you reveal yourself to me? Would you show me who you really are, Lord Jesus? I'm open and I'm ready. I want to find out more about who you are. Show yourself to me in Jesus' name. God answers prayers like that. He shows up to people and he will heal you. Uh, so you cry out to him today. Pick up that phone. Give us a call. Up next, Dr. Mary Lynn will share some powerful tips to transform your thought life. People want to know, is there a plan and how do you find it? CBN presents The Plan, eight keys for understanding God's will for your life. We're going to talk about God's plan for your life. Is there a plan for everyone's life? In Pat Robertson's latest teaching, you'll discover the secret to knowing and living out God's unique purpose for you. The plan of God will be unfolded in your life in ways you couldn't believe possible. In The Plan, Pat reveals the principles to understanding God's will so that you will be filled with peace, provision, joy, and satisfaction. Plus, see amazing stories of how others are living out their individual purpose intended by God. God is faithful <laughs> and we did what he told us to do. Live the life God has designed for you. I hope that God works out a plan in you that will bring blessing, joy, peace, and happiness. Get the plan. Available now. I want you to 
stop right now and consider the last few moments of your life. So what thoughts just went through your mind? What worries or complaints went through your thoughts over the last few minutes? Or did you find this exercise hard to do? You know, many people find this difficult because they're just not used to paying attention to their thoughts or emotions. But you know, if you're not taking the time to reflect, you might actually find yourself experiencing life as if you have no control over things. There's a growing body of research that shows the thoughts we hold have great power to impact our overall health and well-being. Our thoughts actually impact the hormones that are released by our brain and the way we respond to a given situation. They impact our sleep, our concentration, our moods, and our ability to cope with stress. If our thoughts are negative, our brains will release destructive neurochemicals that have an adverse impact on our brains, our bodies, and also our emotions. And conversely, positive thoughts improve our happiness and well-being, and they lower our physical and emotional stress. But because negative thoughts appear to carry greater weight in our brains, we actually need a minimum of five positive thoughts to balance each negative thought. Multiple studies have found that optimistic people have far more positive outcomes in their experiences. They have better health, they live longer, they have greater resilience, they have healthier relationships, and they're even more successful in their careers. Now, some of us are more naturally wired to be optimistic and others pessimistic. And our way of thinking is also impacted by our family of origin and the mindset of our parents. Regardless though, the good news is that you can learn to manage your thought life which can then give you control over your overall well-being and experience of life. Optimism is a learned skill. It takes practice and repetition before we can master it. And all of us can learn to do this. God has wired all of us to be able to overcome difficulties in our lives with His help, to experience great joy and peace and freedom regardless of our circumstances. So if you'd like to learn how to be more optimistic and positive in your thought life, try this. First of all, pay attention to your thought life. As you pay attention to your thoughts on a regular basis, you're gonna get better at this skill and you're gonna be able to recognize negative thinking sooner. Use your emotions to help you because when you're feeling bad, there's a good chance there's some negative thinking behind those emotions. And then second of all, notice when you have a negative thought. Identify the negative thought and the more specific you can be, the better. And over time, you're gonna find that there's gonna be themes with your negative thinking. And third of all, reframe your negative thought. The sooner you can put a stop to the negative thinking, the better. So how might your worry or critical thought or angry response be reframed in a more positive light? Fourthly, refuse to give ground to the negative thought. Actively fight your thought by refusing to ruminate on that negative thought. Find a verse in the Bible that deals specifically with your thought. Repeat that verse as many times as you need to cancel out that negative thought. You can even say the verse out loud to really fight that negative thought. And then fifthly, focus your thoughts on the positive. On a daily basis, just flood your mind with uplifting thoughts and words. Set aside time each day to think about things for which you're grateful. Think about scripture verses that bring you a sense of hope and peace. It might feel a little unnatural at first, but keep it up because you're releasing happy hormones in your brain. And lastly, get some accountability and help. If you're really serious about turning things around in your mind, give permission to a few trusted friends and family to challenge you every time they sense some negative thinking happening. And if necessary, consider getting help from a professional if you'd really like to get a good handle on your negative thinking. I'm Dr. Mary. Daddy? Yeah, buddy? How many nickels are in a dollar? There are 20 nickels Look, in a dollar. How do birds fly? Does milk really make my bow stronger? Yeah, yeah. Daddy, when we die, will we go to heaven? Do you have the answer to life's biggest question? Call the 700 Club. We'll help you find answers to the important questions life brings your way. Welcome back. Lori, we've been talking all day about our identity being in Christ mm -hmm. and not in the things that we do. Yeah, and you know, Brian, I think this is a missing link for so many people in mm -hmm. the Christian life, that too many people live even defeated as yes. followers of Christ because they don't know who they really so are. True. And the scripture tells us who we are in Christ. Yes. When we start 
taking on and believing what God says about us. Yeah. We are adopted, we are forgiven, we are set free, we are blessed, we are placed in heavenly places. We yes. have all the spiritual yes. riches of heaven available yes. to us. Christ is in us. This is the truth of the gospel. And that identity will help you overcome anything in life when you know who you really are. Well said. And you know, that really speaks about the plan that God has for us. And uh, these are eight keys that help you understand the will of God for your life. Colossians 2.10 says, we are complete in Christ Jesus. Not in what we do and not in what people say, but in Christ Jesus. And this is our thank you to you when you become a monthly partner with the 700 Club Canada for $20 a month. And it allows us to continue this life-changing message, but it allows you to move in that call and plan that God has for your life. And it would be such an encouragement if you'd call now, 1-855-759-0700. Prayer partners are standing by. And with that $20, you will change the world. You know, Brian, I just feel compelled to say, um, often we ask the question, what is God's will for my life? And uh, can I just reframe the question for you? It's what is God's will? And when you start just paying attention, God's word is full of instructions mm -hmm. for us to follow. Do what he's already told you to do, right? Yeah. Walk in the way he's already told you to, and you will. it will become so clear the next thing he tells you to do. Let me pray that. Father, I thank you. The steps of a good man and a good woman are ordered of the Lord. And I pray that even now you would revisit your child, that they would hear what your will is and your will will be so clear for their lives. Now let it be released. We receive it on their behalf in Jesus' name. In Jesus' Amen. name. Hebrews 13, 15 to 16 says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Mm -hmm. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. That'll Until keep you busy time. all day long. Yes. Hey, keep it real. Until next time. God bless. Take care. To contact us, phone 1-855-759-0700. You can email us at cba at 700club.ca or write to us at Christian Broadcasting Associates, Incorporated. The 700 Club Canada, P.O. Box 700, Scarborough, Ontario, M1S 4T4. You can now like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter or Instagram.